constructed of wood and about the size of an old-fashioned wall telephone. The wee door turned on a hinge and had a bell and a doorknob of regular size. With Andrew's permission, she brought it upstairs into her snug little booth, where the control board was carved out as if to accommodate a well-filled belly. Sliding her wheeled chair into its embrace, she operated switches and pots, rolling to the left and right to work the turntables on either side. In the privacy of her late night show, which displaced the network from midnight to 1 a.m., the agent said that every time she came upon that phrase, it gave her great pleasure to take out her pencil and stroke it out. <laughs> so, so Gwen's struggle, you know, in trying to find her feet in radio, trying to, to find an exit from her inhibitions, uh, wasn't unlike my own, actually, in, in writing the novel, which is to escape our limitations and enter a larger world. Now, at a certain point, several of the characters leave the confines of the radio station, and they enter a landscape that's also a soundscape. They journey through the Arctic barren lands, the barren grounds, following in their, in their route, following in the footsteps, really, of an earlier Englishman, uh, not an explorer exactly, but an eccentric Englishman, John Hornby, who, with two companions, starved to death in the Barrens in the winter of 1927. Um, so the novel becomes, from, from, from starting at a radio station, it becomes a kind of an open-air novel, because they're outside all the time. So the basic structure of the novel moves from the, the close quarters of a radio station, a hothouse of insecurities and rivalries and loyalties and loves, out into the cool house of an ever-widening Arctic landscape. And it's a structure that mirrors the way radio waves circle out into great distances. And I think maybe rather than, than uh, reading more, I should uh, stop there and and see if if, uh, if anyone has a question they'd like to ask or a comment they'd like to make. We could, uh... Yes? Um, I noticed with a lot of your descriptions, they're very sensual. Uh, you mentioned that one where the smell of apples, uh, the, little, the volume dial on, uh, on, on the radio announcer's uh, pod. Uh, do you find when you write that you're these things come naturally? Are you, are you very conscious of the things you, you sense when perhaps you were in radio before? Do, do you make a point of emphasizing the sensual? I guess is what I'm asking. Right. Do I make a point of emphasizing the sensual? Uh, I, I, I don't want it to be over sensuous, right? I don't. Um, I, I, I think. I think um, Overly lush writing wears a bit thin. At least it does for me. So I, I like, of course, writing that's uh, very tangible, visual, and and concrete. And uh, and yes, in images. I mean, I started out writing poetry, and I wasn't really a very good poet, uh, but. Images do, do sort of come easily, naturally, when I'm writing. And it's the, just about everything else that requires a lot of effort. So um, the scenes that I have to write, or the whole structure of the novel, I have to work really, really hard at basic narration. Um, but, but I love to be able to, um, I love, Clear writing that, that where you can really see things, and um, and yet writing that's compact and economical. So my mom was a painter. My mother uh, really isn't able to paint anymore, but she spent her life painting. And and I think maybe I I have no gift with my hands at all, um, but maybe there's a uh, a visual sense that I might have 
picked up from her. Because your descriptions were very visual. I can almost, I can almost picture the environment you were describing. Yeah. Well, were that's good. That, that, I'm, I'm glad. And um, I used to, years ago, teach writing at night to adults. And I, I, in preparing for one of those classes that I had to give, I remember reading um, what it's like for a child to read. How, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're a child reading or being read to, and it's Beatrix Potter that's you're, you're immersed in, then, then the child actually is going up that path to that door and into that house. You are right there. And, and, and I love to try to recapture that when I write, for me, you know, for, my, for myself, because it's such a thrill. Thank you. Yes. Um, is the book, does the book largely romanticize um, life on the radio? Is that how you remember it? Did you consciously set out to do this, or you know, inject some of fond memories? And does that contrast with maybe how you view radio today? Maybe you talk about how it's a different world, how you can't how jobs are scarce, and maybe you have a different view on Well, I, I, had a, I grew up with radio, and I had a romantic view of radio. I, I, I loved radio. And, um, and, and in my you know, young mind, um, Glenn Gould, who, who, who adored radio and listened to radio all the time, the, the famous pianist who, who uh, played Bach like a, uh, like a prince. Um, so so I had, I, when I, I'd always kind of wanted to work in radio, but in the background. So as a young woman looking for work, right, I couldn't find anything like that in Toronto, which is why I ended up sort of in the hinterland. But um, I don't know, I don't know if, I don't think I romanticize it. Maybe I do it, maybe I romanticize it. The, the, the competition in radio between the different, you know, between Dido and Gwen is, is, is rather naked at times, and the, the distrust, and, and because when you're on air, you're so exposed, um, your ego is exposed too. And, and, and when you're young, person like, like Gwen really isn't equipped to know how to deal with all of the waves of, of, um, of insecurity that come over. So, but I do love exploring that. You know, I love exploring um, the, the emotions that capsize us. Now, Harry's an old hand, and he's really quite jaundiced about radio. Um, and, and yet, to get back to your question about, about romance, the, 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 we, we have romantic notions about radio, we have romantic notions about the North, and um, I think what feeds this romantic um, view we have in the case of radio is the intimacy that's available. I mean, it's a lovely medium, can be. And of the North is just so story-filled filled and vast and, and, and dramatic, and dramatic in a kind of desolate way that it appeals to the romantic in us.